packed house today. And and so and so then the chicken tells the Japanese game developer that oh, is why I really. put yes that's what he said. <laughs> Sorry. All right. You sort of ruined it. I, I know. I couldn't help myself. Are you uh, Are you prepared? Uh, I was uh, birthed prepared. Justin Robert Young. Uh, I I was born quotable. <laughs> Here we go. Today, the new tech show with Thomas Mariti, the two du podcasting français, Monsieur Patrick Bezia, as para Patreons comme moi. S'il vous plaît, vous joindre à nous, patreon.com slash acedetect. J'espère à Général Somalapla, quelqu'un du Kentucky, n'est-ce? This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, July 13th, 2015. I'm Tom Merritt. Joining me today, Patrick Beja on a Monday. Veronica Belmont will be on a Tuesday this week. How are you doing, Patrick? Are you disoriented? I, I am uh, still laughing from that intro. It's it's excellent, fantastic. So how yes, would you say I, it in French? Uh, you would have to send me the full text, and <laughs> I would record it. No, your evaluation of it. How would you say? Oh, it oh, right. Uh, C'est fantastique. But you oh, know, the, the interesting thing is that uh, he he does the the rolled R's. I don't know if you call them like that in English, but he he does yeah. R. And we don't do that in French. I That's don't know why. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Justin Robert Young is here as well today. How are you, sir? Missed opportunity for the French, Patrick. I feel like like the rolled R's, you know, they're they're just a great addition to any uh, language. You know, it just spices it up a little bit. Uh, this is uh, an amazing panel that we have here today, Tom. And. Uh, you know, unfortunately, it has to be under such sad circumstances. Yeah, uh, the, our top story in the headlines, no spoiler, is uh, the passing of President Satoru Iwata of Nintendo. Uh, we do have Chris Kohler, author and editor from Wired, will be joining us for the discussion section. So let's get right to the headlines. Uh, as we said, Nintendo President Satoru Iwata died Saturday at the age of 55 due to a bile duct growth. Iwata worked at HAL Laboratory in the 1980s where he worked on lots of Nintendo games like Balloon Fight and Earthbound. Uh, he joined Nintendo as GM of corporate planning in 2000 and was appointed the fourth ever president of Nintendo in 2002 and the first not to come from the founding family. Uh, like I said, that's going to be our topic for our main discussion today. Ars Technica reports that Comcast revealed pricing for 2-gig fiber internet service in the U.S. residential market, which will cost $300 a month, with fees up to $1,000 for installation and activation. Equipment, taxes, and other fees may also be added into the price. And installation will require eight or six to eight weeks to complete. But hey, there's a promotional price for $159 a month, it will launch, uh, supposedly, in Florida, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Tennessee, and California this month. $500 activation fee? Is what they said? <sighs> Being back from Finland, as I've said multiple times, this makes me, I don't know, cry or laugh or maybe both. But Yeah, cry, laugh, cry. Look, cr laugh, I. Cry, yes. But, but what's really uh, uh, upsetting about this is just the fact that they are not even in league with other, uh, you know, residential uh, similar speed. But uh, they have two gigabits, Justin. <laughs> uh, yeah. It is impressive. I'll give them that. If well, only uh, there was an audio representation of how hard I'm rolling my eyes right now. <laughs> well, rejoice then, because according to ZDNet's Marito Foley, to celebrate the launch of Windows 10 on July 29th, Microsoft will host a number of fan celebrations in 13 cities across the world, including Sydney, Beijing, Tokyo, Sao Paulo, London, Berlin, Madrid, Singapore, Johannesburg, Nairobi, New Delhi, Dubai, and New York City. You'll all have noticed that Paris is missing from that hmm. list. So is that um, like. <laughs> What's happening there, Microsoft? Well, they will also launch Windows 10 across ten, uh, 110 Microsoft stores in the US, Canada, and Puerto Rico with in-store events designed to help customers upgrade. I'm sure lots of people are going to go there and be super happy. Microsoft is also expanding its list of Microsoft Surface tablet uh, distributors from a couple of hundred to a few thousands worldwide. The plans were announced today at Microsoft's annual worldwide partner conference in Orlando. 
And one of the reasons they're doing that in-store event is because they didn't get, they haven't still got the RTM to manufacturers for Windows 10. So there won't be any Windows 10 machines in the store. You'll have to upgrade them immediately after buying them. Uh, also, is Seattle missing off this list? <laughs> because in Seattle, no one needs help to install Microsoft products. Sir. Yeah, they, they either already work for Microsoft or they're dirty Amazon employees that they don't want to help. I don't point. know. Uh, yeah, I don't know what that means. That is weird. Another announcement from that partner conference passed along by Mary Jo Philly. Microsoft is going to launch a new subscription service this autumn called Cortana Analytics Suite. Subscribers will get the voice assistant Cortana as a front end to... The following, Power by Azure Machine Learning, Azure HD Insight, which is Hadoop on Azure, Azure Stream Analytics, Azure Data Lake, Azure SQL Data Warehouse, Azure Data Factory, Azure Data Catalog, Azure Events Hubs, and the Face Vision Speech and Text Analytics pieces of Project Oxford. All those will be available individually as well. So there you go, enterprise developers, pricing and licensing yet to be announced. Can, can you say Azure one more time, please? Just... I could, I could say it five different ways, and I probably just did. Azure, 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 Azure. Both, both uh, all of them are lovely, Tom. Thank you. Indeed. As is the Azure Drake, a uh, five drop, which uh, gives you one card drop. Plus one spell damage? <laughs> he reports that a supercomputer based uh, at King Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia is the seventh most powerful computer on the planet. The Shaheen 2 is a Cray XC40 computer with a peak number crunching capacity of 5.536 petaflops, making it the highest ranked Middle East system in the 22-year history of the top 550 supercomputer list and the first to crack the top 10. The machine is being used for research projects, modeling turbulence in engines, atmospheric dynamics, and renewable energy grids. Uh, yeah, it's my typo there, the top 500 uh, supercomputer list. But uh, China still ranks number one uh, for the second listing in a row. So this is kind of the big news. Saudi Arabia getting on the list. Well done. Hot for security notes, Facebook security chief Alex Stamos posted on Twitter this weekend that Adobe should announce an end-of-life date for Flash in order to disentangle dependencies and upgrade the whole ecosystem at once. He called for Adobe to announce it, right? He didn't say that they would. Yeah, he works for it. Facebook. Adobe doesn't have exactly. to listen to him. You're right. Adobe has acknowledged three critical vulnerabilities in Flash within the last week alone. So yeah, maybe it would be time. I think Flash, uh, Flash's time might have passed. Yeah, it, it, it's kind of Adobe's, uh, it's up to Adobe to make a, uh, a gentle and elegant exit uh, from Flash. They don't want to look bad and as if they can't keep their product secured, although a lot of people think that. Uh, and they want to make sure that the web keeps working. They can't just pull the plug on support one day and, and abandon it because too many people still use it. Uh, so this is a reasonable recommendation, although I don't know why Adobe would necessarily have to listen to Facebook's security chief other than just Facebook makes up a large amount of traffic on the web. In a quick uh, follow-up, CSO Online notes that a DEF CON talk about proxy ham has been canceled, and its creator, Ben Caudill, will only say that the open source code and documentation will not be made public. So I guess it won't be open source. The source code and documentation will not be made public. Prototypes have been destroyed, and that's it. Proxy ham was that box that would broadcast internet up to two miles away to hide your actual location. You plug it in somewhere with an open uh, Wi-Fi access point and rebroadcast. Uh, lots of conspiracy theories running wild about why this happened. And so what are the big conspiracy theories? Well, that the government got to him, told him to shut it down, that somebody had, uh, you know, threatened. To, but mostly, mostly they involved the government. Yeah. <laughs> Black helicopters. Yeah, black helicopters got to Ben Cottle is, is the conspiracy. I mean, certainly odd. It, it, is, it, is, it is curious. It's not odd for a DEF CON panel to be canceled. It's odd for something to be canceled and then like any acknowledgement of the existence of the project to be removed uh, from the internet. Um, very, very odd.
Time for some news from you. Uh, most of our stories are submitted in our subreddit at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. It helps us put our lineup together every day. We always highlight a few of the ones that we think are a little different than what you're seeing everywhere else. Abituela Condulce sent us the Ars Technica report that four U.S. senators have asked the FCC to gather information on how cable and broadband providers charge their customers, not asking for them to take action, just gather the information. Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont noted that only 37% of Americans have more than one option for high-speed broadband providers. The letter was also signed by Senators Elizabeth Warren, Edward Markey, and Al Franken, and specifically called out Time Warner Cable's pricing arrangements as needing a look. Uh, very interesting. And, and another side note, uh, in the uh, mixture of politics and technology, Hillary Clinton uh, today made mention without saying Uber's name that she as president would crack down on companies that misapplied the 1099 uh, uh, status for uh, their workers, which is really the main issue that Uber faces right now. So Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's why SHIP brought all of their, their employees in-house was a reaction to Uber getting in hot water about that. Very curious now that, uh, you know, technology is mainstream enough that these are kitchen table issues for, for political gain. Star Fury Zeta sent us the news that Comcast will launch a new TV service called Stream, which will offer all broadcast TV networks plus HBO for $15 a month, streaming on your home broadband connection. U.S. residents can view the service on an app for PCs, phones, and tablets. Recode reports that the service will start rolling out in Boston at the end of the, uh, at the end of this summer, and come to Chicago and Seattle after that with more markets in 2016. Yeah, this is kind of an evolution, and if you want to hear us talk more about it, uh, listen to Cord Killers, which uh, Brian Brushwood and I will record later today with Lamar Wilson. Uh, but it's gone from them offering HBO plus local channels for $40 a month as long as you sign up for regular cable to will basically give you HBO for its regular price and all the broadcast channels for free and you don't have to have a cable box. But then they don't have to roll installers, so it makes sense. Uh, Comcast just seems like they are wildly flailing. Like, and not to say that it's not good, it just there doesn't seem to be a ton of cohesion to the movements that they are making since the big uh, big net neutrality ruling over the last uh, year or so. This one seems to make a little more sense to me, but well, I, I, yeah, I don't I know what you're saying. I don't mean to say that they don't make sense. It, it just it doesn't it doesn't feel like there's one big plan that they're like, okay, well, here's the future. Like this is a good move. I think this is a good service. I think, you know, you, now that you say that, look at it, the headlines today. Their plan is, we must make our money on two gigabit per second broadband because we're not going to make it on TV anymore. <laughs> yeah, which is uh, kind of crazy considering like two gigs, like for forever they've been telling us, hey, you don't need more than a trickle. You know, just a little bit of internet will do you. Now it's like, no, you need to buy the Costco-sized helping of internet. <laughs> And all the while, I'm. What did we say? Lacro laughing. Can't remember. Yes. Lacro laughing. <laughs> and finally, Scotty Rowland let us know that starting this week, in direct response to Amazon, Walmart.com customers can look forward to thousands of discounts on the site, special atomic deals and a decreased threshold for free shipping of thirty-five dollars. So basically, begun the price wars have, which I can also read in the voice uh, that is going to follow right now. Mm, begun the price wars have. Prequel illusion. Just saying. I, I'm, I'm not saying that's what it is, but it might be. And that's a look at the headlines. All right, uh, let's bring in Chris Kohler, author of the book Power Up and editor for Wired's Game Life in uh, to talk with us. Chris, thanks for joining. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry it has to be on such sad news, uh, but Patrick, it seems like the internet is uh, in, in mourning over the passing of President Iwata. You know, that was uh, somewhat surprising. He is the CEO of a very, very powerful uh, gaming company. And myself, when I read the news, I found myself, you know, uh, uh, taken aback and sort of emotionally affected by his passing. passing. And I wasn't sure why, but I, I also noticed that many others have uh, experienced the same thing, the surprise included. Um, so, Chris, do you have maybe a, a, a reason why the death of that uh, CEO would affect us in that way? 
Uh, well, I mean, first of all, it, it came as uh, a, something of a surprise. Um, Iwata was only 55 years old. We we kind of had inklings that uh, he was that his health was not doing so well, but Nintendo kept it a. I mean, it was a you know Apple kept Steve Jobs' declining health a secret, but Apple was blabbing all about it compared to Nintendo because Nintendo. I mean, it was absolute total lockdown. They said. He had a he had a you know a tumor basically in his uh, his bile duct and uh, and and then and then after that they stopped talking about it and they said he had had a successful surgery um, and then Iwata actually showed up uh, June 26th I believe at the annual meeting of shareholders in Japan he didn't go to E3 but he went to the uh, the meeting of shareholders then he was there and he did the entire thing and he you know he he had slimmed down considerably since his surgery but. He seemed to be the picture of health, and then and then a few days later, you know, he he had died as a result of the complications um, from the cancer that he had, basically. And so it was, a, you know, it's so sad because he had to have known, and his inner circle had to have known um, that he he. I'm sure at some point he was told he only had months or years left um, and and probably towards the low end of that um, and you know for everybody to just sort of put on a stone face and go out and talk about video games at E3 in the presentation with the Muppets and everything like that um, it had to be just destroying them uh, but I mean so not only is it sad to hear um, because you know I- Iwata did all of these live streamed Nintendo Direct presentations by himself and he you know he was the face of Nintendo, um, and everybody knew that he he had been a video game programmer, that he was incredibly passionate about games. He made games. He programmed Earthbound. He create, you know, he helped create Kirby's Dream Land and worked on Super Smash Brothers. And um, but the real tragedy is that he was still uh, CEO of Nintendo, and he was captain of that ship, and all of the success that Nintendo had had over the past decade uh, since he was installed as CEO in the early 2000s, a lot of that was due to his vision um, of games for everybody, you know, of him fighting as the CEO of this publicly traded massive company um, to keep it on the path that, you know, really, really fight for the vision that he and Shigeru Miyamoto shared um, of the types of games they wanted to make and uh, how they were going to sell them to people. And, and you know, as, as people tried to say that Nintendo should, you know, get out of hardware entirely and go to, you know, start making PlayStation 2 games in 2002, to Nintendo should get out of hardware entirely and they should they have to start, they got to put Super Mario Brothers on cell phones for 99 cents. Um, Iwata was able to continually deliver and show them, no, there's there's this better way. And that has been amazing for video games, because when you look at what Nintendo produces, it is just completely far and away out there. It is no, no other company is doing these, these, these specific types of video game experiences. And to lose Iwata, to lose, like, the person who was fighting the hardest for that is you start to see... Nintendo slipping away and you really worry like without Iwata there fighting constantly for this like what is Nintendo going to be in 5 years, 10 years, 15 years and what are we going to miss out on that he would have that he would have provided for us that quite frankly a lesser person would not be able to and that's I think that's what is kind of hitting a lot of people today. Uh Chris for those of uh, our listeners who are not particularly gamers or, or followers sure. of the gaming industry, uh-huh. uh, but yet know Nintendo as such a huge part of their childhood and have identity to that company, uh, can you describe kind of what his legacy was specifically over the last 10 years and, and, and where his uh, uh, vision really guided the company? So it is. It is very strange uh, for these president CEO of, of of any company, but especially you know a video game company in today's day and age, uh, for that president CEO to be um, uh, to come out of a programming background um, or even a you know game design background rather than just simply you know doing the MBA and et cetera. Because 
and, and and that's not because these people aren't brilliant. It's because it's just not their thing. They want to make. They don't necessarily, you know, running, being the CEO of a, of a, of a you know, publicly traded major multinational corporation is its its own total set of skills. It's um, not for everyone. It's, no, <laughs> no. And it's fascinating that Iwata, having conquered, because uh, by all accounts, he was a brilliant genius programmer uh, I mean he you know he, he worked on balloon fight so I mean he was he was there in the earliest days of Nintendo that's a very early NES game that Nintendo did um, and it's so strange that having sort of hit this apex and being this like John Carmack level genius programmer he decided you know what I'm gonna now learn this totally new thing and I'm gonna learn about how to run a company uh, and at the I mean he when he became president of Nintendo and he was he was he was only the fourth president of Nintendo ever uh, since the company's founding in 1889, and he was the only person who was not from the Yamauchi family that founded Nintendo in 1889 as the playing card company. Uh, so huge deal that this guy was kind of being, as far as the public knew, sort of pulled out of nowhere uh, to become the new CEO. And his what he did as soon as he got in, as soon as he got into Nintendo, he started talking about. We have to make games for everybody. Video games in 2000, 2001, the PlayStation 2 era, people were very high on the PlayStation 2, but PlayStation 2 was delivering one kind of experience, and it was the, the experience for the super hardcore player um, who looked at a PS2 DualShock controller with its, like, 18, 19 buttons and says, I totally understand this. I know what I'm going to do. Um, and the, the problem is, there, you know, the other 95% of the world was, was left out at this point. There were no, people were not gaming on their cell phones in 2002. And so Iwata was just like, let's, let's do a 90 degree turn here. Let's, let's not try to make the next piece of Nintendo hardware. Let's not chase after these gamers, especially because, again, 2002, Microsoft was, was, was smashing its way into the video game industry with tons of money. They, they said, let's just, let's just not worry about gamers anymore. Let's, let's make products to try to capture tons more people into gaming, and then we can make buttloads of money. Uh, and it absolutely worked <laughs> out. People did not understand this at first. I mean, people really did not get what he was trying to do. Um, there was a famous, uh, sort of infamous story that ran in, I think, Time Asia, in which um, you know, they did an interview with Iwata, and they came away saying, this guy wants to make, and this is a direct quote, thumb candy for dummies. They just, they just thought he wanted, when he was talking about simpler games, you know, what he was talking about was like brain age. What he was talking about was, were, were things, you know, games that like anybody could get into that were deep, but that were easy to control. And that's why the Nintendo DS had a touch screen. And that's why the Wii U used motion controls. The idea of just sort of like swinging the controller and, you know, swinging a tennis racket. Um, you could make complex games for people, but you had to do it in a way that was just easier for them, that the, the things they saw in their brain they could easily affect on screen and that was the introduction really um, of the the mainstreaming of touch screens uh, for entertainment in general and the the biggest problem that Iwata has had or, or had had in the last few years is that you know with iPhones and with tablets um, people were out Nintendoing Nintendo uh, and they had picked up on what he had done and ran with it. And honestly, I mean, you know, if you look at the, the iPhone and the touchscreen and everything like that, I mean, the Nintendo DS was 2004. Um, and that was three years prior to the introduction of, like, touchscreen gaming on, on the iPhone. And it really kind of, like, set the path that we're on right now. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting to me when I looked at all the articles today, how many quotes you have from Iwata about the importance of content. And in fact, he gives, uh, he gives credit to Shigeru Miyamoto for, for teaching him that lesson uh, and how he, he said, let's not focus on what the hardware can do and pushing the hardware to its limit. Let's focus on the games and what they can do. And Patrick, I know you've, you've followed Nintendo closely uh, over these years. Uh, it, it does seem to stand out as being both the blessing and the curse of his legacy. Well, there is, I mean, there is an argument to be made that those uh, successes that are huge, particularly with the Wii, unfortunately reached a, a very wide audience that didn't stay. Uh, so there is an argument to be made there. But what is definitely, um, uh, you know, the success of the Wii is... Uh, 
undisputable. Um, and the other thing that is very stark uh, for in, in start coming very clearly from Nintendo is that love of um, game design and that expertise that very frankly very few other companies reach. Um, and and I'm wondering, uh, Chris, in your opinion again, how much of this love for the craft and and uh, quite frankly. Uh, uh, ability to design those games in a way that is uh, unparalleled helps keeping Nintendo at the top, you know, in, in certain ways, business-wise, because they're still here. They might not be doing super well, as well as they were doing before, but they've been here for the many years, and they're one of the only ones that are still here, and in the hearts of, of people who can play their games. Yeah, nobody ever has constant success in the video game industry because it's such a young industry and because, I mean, things change every day. There's always a new piece of technology. Some, there, there's so many new game ideas people can come up with. It would be very strange for any one company to be just, like, riding on the top of that industry forever. You know, Sony had a big drop with PlayStation 3. Nintendo had a drop in the, the GameCube era and then came back up. They're having some troubles now. The the long-term core of the company, though, has got to always be not just chasing whatever you think is important, but in just constantly attempting, trying to innovate and try new things. And then, you know, eventually you hit on something that does really well. The Nintendo DS did not do super well at first, but it really did well with the introduction of games like Brain Age. You know, you're always a couple of killer apps away from really changing things up. And so... For Nintendo to really try to hang on to um, to to that ability and that that method and that procedure of like innovating and coming up with new games and making hardware because like you know you can you you have to really be able to make the gaming hardware as well so that you can make them kind of harmoniously intersect. Um, the Wii Remote was nothing without Wii Sports. Um, the the Super Mario 64 and the analog stick and, and just going back and back and back. So. It, Nintendo has to always keep that at its core, and if it can do that, it can weather the bad times, and it can potentially come up with another big hit, huge product that sends them into the stratosphere again. Um, it's it's video games; like there's, you can always do something new. You never have to worry that that everything has already been done. Uh, so, so not only is this uh, a tragedy, and, and obviously you have a lot of outpouring of grief. But as you've mentioned, this is a very interesting, transformative time for Nintendo, the company, specifically with their announcement to do their own mobile gaming and to start to get into the non-hardware-tied uh, programming. How does Iwata passing right now affect that transition uh, and, and their future? I, it seems to me like it's the absolute worst possible time for this to happen because had he, uh, you know, I mean, had this been happening when Nintendo was doing incredibly well, they might have, uh, you know, it, it was okay, well, we can sort of ride things out uh, and find new leadership, but it's like it, they needed this vision uh, to pull them through. And this is not to say, I mean, I'm sure that, you know, I Iwata has spoken to a lot of people and they understand what he was trying to do and will try to pick that ball up and, and run with it, but yeah, I mean, it's got to just be a, a, an absolute just terrible blow um, to Nintendo as they continue, um, because they are, in fact, you know, they're going to put some content on smartphones. They just struck a deal with DNA, the smartphone game maker in Japan. Uh, that's going to happen this year. They've, they're signing... Nintendo seems to be uh, doing more deals than they have in the past. In the past, Nintendo has been very much like, we're not really going to work with you. Um, but now it's like, okay, Super Mario Brothers attractions in Universal and uh, working with Activision to put Donkey Kong and Bowser Mario characters into uh, their Skylanders game. Like, that's a lot of things that were sort of unprecedented before are now happening. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's to, to be in this sort of tumultuous transitional period... Um, for the company has, has got to be pretty bad. But, I mean, in general, it's just, like, it's it's bad for video games. Like, I don't see how this is not a terrible loss for anybody who kind of, like, you know, is in love with this, you know, the medium of the 21st century and is excited about its future. To lose somebody who had done so much at such a young age is is it's not just, like, bad for Nintendo's bottom line. It's just, it's terrible just 
for people who love games. Yeah, it almost doesn't matter who replaces him. No one can replace him. This is this means that Iwata's brain is no longer contributing to to the general development of the art, right? And, uh, and, that's, that, and it's so important to mention that, like, like how important that is, which is why I think people keep reiterating, like, you know, this guy, he might have, Iwata at some point might have saved your favorite Nintendo game by, you know, like like getting in and fixing like yeah, he literally did bug stopping. smashing on super smash brothers right there's a famous interview where after, he talks about that after yeah. he's become a nintendo executive right like after it was it was no longer his job and he just saw this go- you know i mean at it, it, it's a, a, again like it's it's kind of like you know john carmack in in a way you know like never wanting to lose those the, the programming part as you know as he kind of moved away uh from that or moved up the food chain but yeah Super Smash Brothers was not going to hit its schedule, and he was just like, we're going to debug this game. Well, for the moment, Nintendo is being very cautious. Uh, Genyo Takeda, uh, who is the hardware GM, and Shigeru Miyamoto, who everybody knows, he's the guy who created Mario and all of that stuff, uh, are retaining their roles as representative directors, and Iwata was also a representative director. But they are not naming a replacement uh, at this point, they're not naming an interim. Uh, they're they're taking it very slowly. Uh, before we let uh, Chris go, any uh, any ideas? Uh, it seems like Miyamoto's getting the early conversation about getting the nod to become president. Uh, yeah, I mean that's. I should really say that's not going to happen. I mean, if if it does, I'd be like blown away because, as we said. Uh, the the study of like how to run a major business like this is is not something that Miyamoto has ever uh, wanted to do. He is a game creator, and if anything, he has he's trying to take steps back uh, from because you know he he kind of like stepped down as the guy who runs the Mario and the Zelda division. He's making Star Fox with a small team now, and he's he's actually said he's not really participating in the creation of the NX, which is the next console that they're doing. So he seems to have kind of put himself off to the side because I think he's I think he's tired of like the grind basically, uh, and I think wants to enjoy his time with the company and like be more creative. I think he's sixty seven. Is that right? Something like uh, that. something like that. But he yeah. is not the next CEO of Nintendo, and it's probably going to be. I mean, it's got to be somebody from that business side. Uh, it's you know, it, you know, and that person, you know, maybe they did have a background in game creation and sort of came over to 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 business later in their career. Um, certainly, you, you got to hope it's somebody who has that passion uh, for games and who was you know created Nintendo games before. Uh, um, but it's it's yeah it's it's not Miyamoto. All right. Well, thank you, Chris Kohler, uh, author, as we mentioned, uh, of of the book uh, that is is coming back into print. Right, Power Up. Yeah, spring twenty sixteen. So uh, look for that. Look for that, and of course, you can follow his work over at Wired dot com. Uh, you do the Game Life podcast, right? We do the Game Life podcast. It's uh, it's irregular. <laughs> we might do one this week. Who but knows? if people want to find it, where should they go? Um, just go to uh, just go to Wired.com and go to entertainment and you know it's it's there Wired.com slash category slash game life if you really want to get specific but yeah or actually just follow me on Twitter it's Kobun Heat K O B U N H E A T and then I just tweet out the I tweet things excellent <laughs> that's the, that's the best way to do it Chris thank you so much for talking with us today man I really appreciate thanks it. for having me thank you absolutely. All right, let's get to our pick of the day. It comes from Jamie. Um, before, in- we do, before we do, yeah. Tom, can I just, uh, very quickly, I just want to read this one quote that we've uh, seen everywhere uh, from Satori Wata. We, we wanted to get to it uh, in the, during the, the, the discussion segment. We didn't. Um, basically, I think this encapsulates why he was so highly regarded. Uh, he, when he first, almost when he first came into office at Nintendo as a CEO, a couple of years later, he uh, made a presentation and he said, on my business card, I am a corporate president. In my mind, I am a game developer, but in my heart, I am a gamer. And that really resonated with a lot of gamers, and I don't think a lot of CEOs again could have said something like that with a straight face. So, uh, and, well, there you and go. been believed, and not you know, and and, exactly. and uh, you know, that's the th- that's the difference. Saying it and having people believe that you meant it, I think, is, yeah. is sort of his legacy. All right, our, to get to our pick of the day, Jamie in uh, BC, British Columbia, uh, wanted to recommend a power line adapter. If you guys don't know about power line adapters, they've been uh, essentially extend Ethernet over your power lines. He wants to recommend TP-Link. Uh, he says you plug one adapter into the outlet by your main router, run an Ethernet cable from the adapter to your router, then go to the room with your device you want to hook up, plug in the other adapter to that outlet, run Ethernet cable from the adapter to your device. Voila, 
You've got an internet connection. The adapter runs the internet using the electricity in your house and promises speeds up to 500 megabits per second for 38 bucks on Amazon. I have heard varying things about Powerline Ethernet, but some people claim they work. I think it kind of depends on the electrical wiring in your house and the electrical system in your area. Uh, but Jamie it says it works for him. So you, if you've been wanting to have Ethernet in rooms of your house without having to get into the walls and run Ethernet wires, this might be something to, to take a look at. I've been using it in a couple of, uh, a different brand, but I've been using it in a couple of uh, places and it works fine for me. So definitely uh, recommend people try Do you remember it. the brand that you've been using? Devolo. Devolo. So D-E-V-O-L-O. -E Devolo, yeah. It, and it works really well. Send your picks to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can find my picks at dailytechnewsshow.com slash picks. Patrick, Justin, you guys are both being immortalized. Did you know this? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I saw the beginning of, of what is an, an epic artistic representation of this fine audio program. Yeah, Ryan has been laboring away just on his own uh, on a poster that has all of us on it, uh, and and he, he's had uh, some life events interrupt him, but by gosh, he has not given up on it. And he wrote to me this weekend and said, the shop is up live at redbubble.com. Uh, he's putting the art that he made on shirts and on posters with my permission. Uh, he says the clothing comes in all sorts of styles and colors, throw pillows, duvet covers, tote bags. Uh, he has it set up for all the money that he makes off it to go to DTNS. And I've told him like, dude, you want to keep a cut of it. You want to keep all of it. This is your artwork. Uh, do what you want with the money. But he, he said he's, he's pretty convinced he wants to continue to support the show. That's entirely up to him. But at the very least, go take a look at the art. Uh, Ryan did an amazing amazing job on this redbubble.com slash people slash DTNS gifts slash shop. Uh, and he just did this all on his own. Uh, I, I can't, I can't say just how much I'm blown away uh, by the dedication here uh, and, and, and the work ethic and everything. So, so yeah, if you see Ryan around, you see him on Twitter, you see him in the chat room sometime, uh, give him a nod for this. Good stuff. Uh, Very yeah, cool just, indeed. just exceptional work. It actually reminds me, of uh, the the Beatles revolver cover, the, it's got the, that style to it. Yeah, yeah, it looks uh, it, it looks so amazing, and to be part of it is just uh, just a delight. So thank you so much to Ryan. This is amazing. Yeah, thanks, man. That's a I'm blown away. Uh, and thanks you guys uh, for being on the show, uh, Patrick Beja. You want to hear more of Patrick talking about gaming? Uh, you got to check out Pixels. Absolutely, on Frenchspin.com. We actually just recorded an episode today with uh, Mark the Terpster Turpin, um, and we did talk about uh, both the passing of Satori Iwata. We went into a little bit more detail uh, there, so if you want to hear more about that, you can listen to that. And we discussed uh, Batman Arkham uh, Knight, which is my contender, my main contender for Game of the Year already, and we went into details about that as well. That's all available at frenchspin.com. The show is called Pixels. And Justin Robert Young is going to change the way you view the election this year. Well, we certainly hope so. Uh, the Contender is a card game that you can follow, uh, twitter.com slash contendergame. Uh, we are going to be debuting our website. We shot our Kickstarter video over the weekend, so hopefully more and more and more will be made available for folks who want more information on what some are already calling a gigantic project I shouldn't have put on my plate. <laughs> <laughs> and by some, do you mean yourself? or uh, Yeah, the, the, yeah. the voices in my head that are uh, being created from the uh, amount of stress that I'm under. Dude, uh, that if, if it makes any difference, I think it's brilliant uh, and totally worth the effort. Uh, you know, it, it, it was it was super fun to shoot the video, and I'm really, really, really excited to get it in the hands of everybody. So, uh, effectively, it is uh, Cards Against Humanity. If uh, you were creating uh, conversations or sorry arguments in a debate, uh, presidential debate style format, hopefully everybody likes it. Uh, but uh, we will certainly have more information forthcoming from now. Or right now, though, follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of it at Contender Game. Yeah, follow Justin on Twitter, twitter.com slash Justin R. Young. And follow Patrick, too, twitter.com slash not Patrick. Uh, and follow us on over to Patreon and become one of our bosses. You know, if you become a co-executive producer, there is a level at which you can back the show that gives you the right to call yourself that. Uh, you get access to the template for business cards. And uh, several people, including Dark Redeemer, have printed out their own business cards to prove that they are, in fact, co-executive producers of the show. Uh, that's 
that's just one of the perks. Uh, mostly the perk is you, you help us continue to make the show like we did today. So check out dailytechnewsshow.com slash support for any information about all the different ways you can support the show. Every once in a while, we get somebody, uh, we got somebody recently who said, ah, I'm not able to, to, to pledge any more money. You know, things are bad, economy is down, whatever. Uh, telling people about the show, just spreading the word is good too. Uh, so thank you to everybody who supports the show in whatever way they can. If you're headed to Nerdtacular, by the way, there's a Nerdtacular Daily Tech News Show shirt available. And if you use the code two sides, you don't have to pay for shipping. You just pick it up at Nerdtacular. Go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash store to find that. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. You can give us a call, 512-59-DAILY. That's 512-593-2459. Listen to the show live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern at alphageekradio.com. And our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. Veronica Belmont on Tuesday, tomorrow. Don't let it confuse you. I'll see you then. The show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, that was a killer show. Well done. Uh, I think that was uh, that was that was, that was pretty good. I actually had a question. I was, I was uh, kind of bummed that um, Chris couldn't hang around for the after show. I, I think it would have been too much in the show. But Patrick, you might have uh, a, a sense of this. So the one thing that really surprised me, uh, not surprising, but just struck me, was kind of the brevity and almost cold uh, nature of the official Nintendo press release. Uh, and, and just, and I assume it's just, you Get know. those title votes coming at showbot.tv while we discuss. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I assume that it's just, you know, anywhere between Japanese culture, Japanese business culture, uh, but just like the one line, Satoru Iwata has died, uh, you know, bile duct growth. Like, and, and just his... Yeah. The facts of his life, as opposed to a more, uh, what I would, you know, you have even business uh, press releases on stuff like that tend to be I, a little flowery. I think, I think part of it is culture. I mean, sentimentality, open sentimentality that way, isn't usually expressed, in the especially from a from a corporation because it's considered impolite. Gotcha. Um, but you know, it's you know, for for a lot, you. I think, at least in Western societies, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a propensity to kind of spin everything into kind of a emotion that people can, uh, for the better part of a, you know, lack of a better term, they can kind of uh, relate to, you know, if if someone like Steve Jobs or, or something, you you definitely have that impact. But, you know, it's you you can't really see everything through that lens. Oh yeah, no, and, I mean. I, I, think I, I understand what you're saying, but to me, that just that that isn't all that remarkable. I mean, that was pretty common in the U.S. up until like the '80s. Like, actually, they were still doing all the way to the end of the '80s. They would well, say I mean, something. Even, even in the U.K., there's still sort of a in the press uh, an inclination to not lionize the dead, to talk about their failures as well as their accomplishments. Whereas the U.S., we've kind of tend to, you know, if somebody has just died, to to go easy. On yeah, and, the I, and I think it's. You know, it's maybe our talk show kind of culture mm. where we where we feed we we, we feel we the need on to them express. so much when they're alive that we feel well, bad. Well, we we, we we feel the need to express, but it's also considered poor form to mm. uh, to to piss on the on the grave of someone, even if they were like the worst boss on the planet, because it's just considered like you you don't do that. Um, and you know, it it does very even like you know, as Tom was saying, it it differs even from closely related cultures on how people treat it. So, well, I think it wasn't necessarily, you know, it was, and 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 not to say that anything is wrong, right? I mean, it's just yeah. it, it's something that that uh, you know, I I looked at and like, oh wow, that was you know, and I read it as like, oh, that's very Japanese to have two line. This person died. This is how they died, and then this is how old they were, as opposed to, and not necessarily. To lionize, right? But just mm -hmm. to like, you know, uh, this person was at the company for X amount of years. He worked on the following things, and he became CEO, like at this point. But even like, not necessarily a lionizing, but just like a a, a kind of uh, a little bit of a, an explanation of, of who they were. We have a baby. Emerging. Yeah, I wouldn't. 
I, I wouldn't say, uh, th you know, I'm not a, a full expert in this, but I, it doesn't feel to me like this is necessarily a Japanese way of approaching it. Uh, I haven't read too many press releases in Japanese, but it, it, my impression is not that, oh, this is how the Japanese do it. It might be in the, these cases, very possible, but it, 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 for me, I would think it's more of just the way they decided to do it in this instance. Okay. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see a couple of lines about, yeah, who he was, where he came from, what his contributions were, these kinds of things. But they didn't even announce that they had a, a plan in place to, you know, uh, well, not at least a transitional plan. They just yeah. said the people in place are going to stay there. Um, so I don't know. I think they wanted to keep it as short as possible, and they definitely did it. Yeah. Uh, by the way, for title, uh, I'm just going to make an executive decision today. Uh, his game ended before its time, mm -hmm. which was Dark Redeemers. Mm -hmm. I just perfect. That's good. Note perfect. Yeah. Well done. Uh, I'm going to make a father decision and check off so I can change. <laughs> okay. <my life. laughs> Thanks, Roger. <laughs> Enjoy. Uh, so, do you need me to uh, upload video? Nothing, or is that good? I mean, I'll do the the post stuff, but the. No, I'll do the regular thing. Okay. But you got the regular thing. Yeah, or... I got the regular thing. Okay. All right. Cool. And then I will see you manana. Cool. Bye. Thanks, Roger. Bye. Yeah, I, I certainly, I mean, I knew that he was beloved and I knew, and I, you know, I'd seen Nintendo Direct and I'd even seen a couple of the uh, Iwata Asks uh, videos and I thought he was an interesting guy, but uh, it, it even took me by surprise just how sincere the outpouring was. Uh, and I think part of that is not just that he was beloved for many good reasons, but also uh, the surprise nature of it. You know, and he was only 55, for goodness yeah, sake. For sure. And we, we didn't have, unlike uh, Steve Jobs, we didn't have any inkling that this was going to happen. Right, except there wasn't for a years-long build-up. Well-treated, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, and it's also, you know, Nintendo in everyone's psyche, even if they aren't, active gamers, it's one of the only gaming companies, big gaming companies, that remains from that golden period of the 80s, uh, late 80s and early 90s. Everyone remembers the NES or Super NES, and it, you can't really say the same, even, you know, for very successful companies like, let's say, Blizzard, you remember them from the late 90s. So yeah. it doesn't your childhood in the same way. Or if there's, you know, an Atari, it's not the same that as the Atari you grew up with, right? Well, and you know that. Yeah, uh, yeah well, Atari has disappeared. Uh, Sega has essentially disappeared. Uh, you know, those those few companies that, that had the same kind of impact are not there anymore. Yeah, Sega's even better. I mean, Atari is out there, but it's just a brand name now. Sega's an even better example where it's still the same company, but it just doesn't feel the same. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah it's, it's not only did they let go of hardware, but they yeah. also, you know, it, ironically or not, um, uh, last week, uh, the president of Sega issued a public apology saying that, you know, he had let down the fans because the quality of the games they're putting out is so low that people just don't trust them anymore. And yeah. they have at least come to that realization. But, you know, thinking this of Atari is... Uh, impossible, you know. The, uh, oh, sorry, of Sega. Uh, back then, they were so big, and it's like you had Neo Geo and NEC with the Turbo Graphics. If you want to go a little bit more niche, but all of those have basically disappeared. Even Square, you know, has merged with Enix, uh, and and Square, which is I Final Fantasy. I almost forget that that was a merger. Most... The, I just think of Square Enix as one thing. You're right. I, I you know, yeah. I just forget. You know, Final Fantasy, it, it could have that kind of emotional impact, but it, it just, even them, they're still here, they're still big, but there's not, it's not the same thing, so. It, it, it is a, maybe the most unique company in that industry, in that, you know, I think we talked about a while ago, and this is before they made the deal with Universal Studios, that, like, Nintendo would be an acquisition target for a company like Disney, you know, just for the IP, you know, just yeah, right. for property and there have been a lot of very very popular video games there have been a lot of very very popular characters but nobody has the enduring uh kind of legacy uh and that uh, repeatedly creates more and more you know that that all of a sudden 
the, the new Zelda game is out and it's great, or there's a new Mario game, there's Super Smash Brothers. They, they continually, successfully renew that well uh, for, their, for, for their IP, which is uh, mind-blowing. And, and, and Iwata was such it a... It does make player. you wonder... Uh, and, and I don't want to be too conspiratorial here, but it does make you wonder if you have Iwata as the kind of CEO who resists pressures to do things like famously, uh, you know, moving to mobile and then porting games specifically to mobile. They're not, that's not even what they're doing with the DNA thing. That when he is now no longer in charge is part of the reason they're not rushing to give more details and rushing to name a, a, a even an interim uh, that they they plan to make a lot of changes that he wouldn't allow them to make i think the big question there would be exactly how ferocious and how many wolves he was keeping at bay on those right. issues by his force of personality and and you know that, that's something that i i certainly don't know enough about the internal politics of that company to make a guess on but uh, you would have to think that there are some market pressures that say, you know, hey, if you were to put Legend of Zelda as a $5 download on Google and the App Store, uh, you would make Y amount of money, and it would be the biggest thing in, in gaming for X amount of time with just a straight port. So uh, that's... Well, the thing uh, is... The, the thing is, uh, Japanese companies, I mean, I don't know the internal politics of Nintendo either, but Japanese companies and Japanese culture in general is based on consensus. And you cannot do anything. Oftentimes, actually, you're paralyzed by the fact that you need everyone on board to do anything. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't have sometimes people that, you know, become political and want to oust someone or, or take the company in a different direction, but... I cannot imagine that in the case of Nintendo now, uh, Iwata was moving, you know, was the one person that was trying to move the company in a certain direction with everyone looking at their, you know, shoes and thinking, ah, when, when he's gone, we're going to be doing things differently. Especially since Nintendo is a, a company from Kyoto, which is even more traditionalist than uh, the, the Tokyo crowd. Uh, so I have to think that he did represent the ethos of a company in a way that was shared by uh, other important uh, people in that company. So I would be surprised if they suddenly changed course or uh, altered these kinds of decisions that have kept them uh, apart you know, from uh, uh, the devastation, really, uh, in the Japanese game industry from, from the past 15 years. Because it is a minefield. Uh, and, and there have been many, many victims, as we said, and Nintendo is still strong out there. So I don't think they would, you know, disavow his uh, uh, the direction he set for the co for, for the company. Um, I, I don't think it would happen. But all right, guys, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna head out. But uh, great show, man. Yeah, well done. Thanks, sir. Uh, yeah. We need to we need to do an FSL tonight recording this week. We do. Uh, uh, we can figure it out, but Wednesday, I think, will probably be best for me. All right. Uh, yeah, email me or text me, and we'll nail down a time. Wednesday hey, works uh, for me, too. All right. Peace all right. out. Cheers. Bye. Uh, and, uh, and I'm out of the post, of nice. all things. So can you believe things. that? Um, oh, wait. I forgot to ask Roger if he would do the show notes. Well, I think... I thought that's what he was implying. Yeah. Okay. That, I, that, <laughs> that he would do his regular bit, which is usually the Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I'll let you guys figure it out for sure. But that's what I took was that he was like, oh, yeah. I'll do my regular show notes okay. bit, but you'll do the video. I dig it. I think that's what's going on. All right. All right. Uh, well, we're going to, this is a sad day, so we're not going to joke we're around. We're not going to do that thing. Yeah. Do. I just don't feel it. Uh, but stay yeah. tuned for Cord Killers immediately following our Nintendo memories.